Uh, you're going to clap again? <laughs> I'm going to try to do a better job this time. Can we give you a round of applause after you clap? <sighs> you got it. That was a good one. All right. Here we are again. Episode 51 of the Carmudgeon Show. My something is- something Haggerty uh, Podcast Network. Yes. Part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. Yeah. My name is Jason Space Camisa. And your name is Derek Tam hyphen Scott. Derek Space Tam hyphen Scott, technically. Okay. Glad we got that sorted out. Um, I feel like I need to tell you that this episode is sponsored by Pennzoil, where performance goes beyond just protecting engines. Whether you like screamy things, like a GT3, or turbocharged things, like a GTI, Pennzoil makes an oil for you. I can't help but notice you own both of those cars. Well, then they make two oils for me. Wow. I would hope they would make more than that, but the proof is in the Pennzoil. We'll have to investigate. Yes, we will. In the meantime, however, we have a discussion to have. I have an existential question for you. Do tell. Okay. Is Miata always the answer? Yes. Next Real, question. No, yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. What if I told you that the answer is a Miata NB? Then I would say you need to have your head looked at. Okay, so then Miata is not always the answer. Well, it doesn't specify which Miata. That's the trick question, because if Miata is always the answer, and one of those answers could potentially be not the right answer, then Miata might not always be the answer. But then the other, the right answer is other Miata. Not necessarily, but we'll get to that later. So, uh, NB, for those of you who don't live in Miata land, is the second generation of Miata. So, 1998 to 2005? I don't know. I think. So very simply, the generations go N-A. N-B. That's the first one. That's the first one. N-B. It's the second one. N-C. Well, I, third third and, one. And then N-D is the current and fourth generation. Current and fourth. Yeah. And more importantly, there but are... T- they also made like little revisions. <gasps> like BMW calls it a life cycle impulse. LCI. Which I think is just stupid. It's a facelift. Yeah. I, that terminology is doofy. Dumb. Elsa, life cycle impulse. That's what happens when marketing people get involved in product planning. Uh, and they're like, well, we're not going to call it a facelift. And we're not going to call it an update. We're going to call it a life cycle impulse. Which would almost be acceptable if it were in German. But in English, that just sounds dumb. It just is almost meaningless. Well, I think the idea behind it is that they're impulsing life inside the cycle no the idea is that they're trying to resurrect sales right they're trying to pump life into an otherwise aging and dying car yeah i mean impulse is like a zap right it's they're zapping the the product with a little bit more juice yeah some some of bmw's lcis have been really good i think the e90 one was quite good yeah got rid of the milk mustache and gave a gave bunch of buttons to the iDrive, for example and uh the the character lines on the bonnet i think really helped too it's not the a British hood. car. It's <clears> not <throat> a hood. bonnet. The bonnet's the thing that you wear on Easter when you go hopping around and asking for chocolate or some shit. Oh, the Jesus holiday. Yes. Um, uh, but I would also say E65 7 Series is possibly the best LCI of all time because it went from being, what's the Just term? sort of like makes your eyes bleed. Fugly. Yeah. Mm. To being just ugly. Which yeah. Huge you got rid of an entire letter. Entire. The F. Well, which stood for a whole string of expletives of just how fucking ugly it was yes 100 percent. i um the lci approach i think to the e90 was a good one the back was quite a bit tidier too slimmed it in my opinion my my thoughts on the e90 were that it doesn't really matter what it looked like because the car drove so well i thought it was ugly from start to finish but really yeah never was a fan of it when i when the, the e90 came out i mean this was after the e65 and the e60 came out i was like Oh, thank God. I guess had it immediately come after the E46, then it would have been like, "Mm, it's fine. But because it came after two such ugly cars, it was like, oh, it's beautiful. Oh, I didn't think that. I remember thinking, I I remember being violent about it. And it was right, I started at Automobile in June. The E90? E90. I started at Automobile in June of 06. And we had a long-term 330i six-speed sport pack car. And it was one of the first things I signed out. I was all like excited about it. But I was 
adamant. Like this car is a fucking failure and BMW is dead to me because I can't stand how everything looks because I genuinely was nauseated by E65, that seven series. And the, and the five series offended me so that the second I saw it, I called the dealer and started a nationwide search for an E39 wagon. Cause I'm like, I'm not getting, I was almost ready to buy a five series in my sort of company car hierarchy. And I'm, I pushed it through. I'm like, I'm not waiting and getting stuck with this fucking horrible, hideous Dame Edna looking, I, don't even get me started on my true feelings on E60. Um, these were the censored ones. These were the censored ones. So I got an E39 and, and when, when E90 came out, that three series, I just thought like, what are they doing? It's just, the car's horrible. And I remember very distinctly walking up to the, the parking garage, it was like the fifth floor that the car was parked on. And I got in it. I'm like, Ugh, this is so annoying. And I had to shove the key in and hit the start button. And it went blung, blung. And I was like, you're stupid. Fuck this shit. And I put it in reverse and I made it out of the parking spot and decided, I don't care. <laughs> it was just the seating. The seat was perfect. It was the sports seats. They were so good. The shifter felt so good. The clutches engagement was perfect pulling out and the weighting of the steering. And I, I'm not kidding. By the time I got out of the parking structure, I no longer cared about how it looked. I, it was just amazing i just wish that were the case today with today's bmws yeah it was the last good bmw in terms of driving dynamics at least of three series yeah the last amazing one i mean they're just uh i have an m240i uh coupe right now uh, that's the one that looks like a 2002 redo I, I think that was what they were going for it's a little bit um can i say this never mind it's a little bit uh aspect ratio challenged it's ugly. Yes. yes. Um, okay, good. Perfect. I mean, aspect ratio challenge. Are you calling it obese? No. Oh, what were you going to say? Chody. <gasps> Do we need to cut that? <laughs> no, we need to celebrate that. Derek used the word chody. I don't like it. I think it's ugly. Um, I, look, look, ugly is BMW's brand dorky ugliness. Has been part of BMW's brand identity for years. 2002 was not a pretty car. Cool looking. Doofy, Jody, Dorkfest, right? And speaking then, of Dor- Dorkfest, right, is the E thirty six eight the uh, clown shoe? Yes. Um, event. So I mean, and the one series was kind of it had like a pregnant cow underbelly. It's part of the BMW design heritage. The problem with the car is the rest of it doesn't look like a BMW. It just looks ugly. Yeah, and doesn't drive well. Mm. So. We were supposed to talk about Miata. Yes. Anyway, somehow there were two versions of I think every generation of Miata, at least two. So NA had the original was a one point six liter, mm-hmm. graduated to a one eight for the nineteen ninety four model year, I believe. Yeah, ninety three, ninety four. Yeah, there. something like that. And then um, got some structural enhancements too. I remember wanting a one point eight liter NA because of the some of the structure changes that they made, and then realized it was still made out of overcooked spaghetti. Mm. Your NA is a one six. It is currently a 1.8, but it was born a 1.6. Yeah. I kind of like the 1.6 better. A little bit more personality. In um, terms of motor or chassis? Motor. Hmm. Motor. Chassis, I don't like either. <laughs> I don't like any Miatas. I, that's not true. That's not true. I, I didn't like my Miata, but I think I had a really bad one. So, I love mine. Yeah, but yours is like, you know, a million mods. Yeah, of, I mean, it's got Olin's. Yeah, anything with Olin's. I mean, Olin's, sorry. Shouldn't we pronounce that correctly? It's like oh, someone I saying Bill Steen. I mean, but that's... You don't speak ha- Ikea? I don't, yeah. <laughs> Swedish. Swedish? Swedish. Is that delicious Swedish? Mm. Is that those meatballs that you get in Ikea? Yeah. Ulins, apparently, is the correct pronunciation. And so how are you supposed to pronounce Bilstein? Bilstein. Bilstein. Bilstein in German. Yeah. But do you call him Bilstein that's or That's how Bilstein? John Davis pronounces it, I think. We're he glad says to have you with us. He says Bilstein. Hello and welcome. We're glad to have you with us. <laughs> Does he say Bill Stein or Bill Stein? Bill Stein. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm fine with kind of either, which is an which is unusual because if somebody says Porsche, I punch them. You just retched in your mouth a little bit. I hope everyone saw that. <laughs> that, was, that was a little bit too much of a sound effect. Thank you. I'm gonna drink to clear my throat from from this from the vo- that no word. from the vomit that came up when I said the word Porsche. Um, <clears throat> All right, so somehow you you have Olin's shocks on your NA. So there's an NA1 and an NA2. And then NB came out, which um, was everything. They It was all the goodness of the NA minus some of the goodness of the NA. With, with um, 
some badness added. Extra badness added, yeah. Like yeah. weight. Like weight and mm. a little bit fluffy looking. Uh, it like a lost, bathtub. Speaking yeah. of BMWs, this is a perfect connection. Kind of looks a little bathtubby like a 2002. The NB. Mm. And then lost uh, pop up headlights. <laughs> but they did introduce the first six speed manual. That was cool. Mm. And a glass rear window, which That's always good. you can put in the NA. Which just renders the NB then pointless. pointless. Okay. Unless so, you want a horribly turbocharged engine, because then oh, you can yes. get the Mazda speed NB. Yes. With much too short gearing. Um, I don't remember that. I remember it having no power, no power, no power. You'd hear the turbo go th- and then hit the limiter and it didn't go anywhere. And I thought like, wow, somehow I think this is actually slower than a regular Miata because you're just waiting for lag on a, like a six to one compression motor that's dead off. Boost. Well, yeah. So it's a reflection of gearing being too short because you use the boost up so fast that you never use the boost. So, okay. And B and C and mm. C came out. And I never loved the way it looked, but I remember driving it and thinking, meh, it's fine. The Miata's days are done. You know, it was just, it was a passing thing that was wonderful for, for NA and sort of has fizzled out. And then NA2 happened. And I remember I was working for Automobile at the time and I called my editor. I was in LA, picked up an NC2 press car. And I called him. I'm like, oh my God, we have to do a piece on this. Like they fixed it. And he was like, oh my God, it's just a stupid update. This is kind of how he talks. Um, mm-hmm, it's just a stupid update on a fucking Miata. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like they did synchros and they did a shift linkage thing. And then the, they took this motor and put new valve train in it. And he's like, mm, what the fuck does that mean? And what it meant was it was like the old one was kind of. What's the forged motor? Didn't they forge all the internals also? I don't remember that. I think that the the updated car has forged motor internals. Well, if he thinks that it must be so, and that means I probably, should, we should probably do homework for the show. No, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> um, but no, all, it woke the motor up because the the old one, I think, red, red line somewhere in the sixes, and it was just kind of fine. And the red line, the printed red line on the NC2 was 7,200, but I will never forget that you could hit a 7,700 RPM before the limiter kicked in. And that last 500 RPM, very much like a 911 GT3, the engine changes pitch, it changes tone, and suddenly sounds like it's going to blow up in all of the right ways and just encourages bad yeah. behavior i mean there's a lot of texture and it all comes into the car the motor's very present and any good driving experience i think the motor should be present yeah dominant and that's one of cars. my yes especially at, at that rev range mm-hmm. and that's one of my complaints about the nd is that that you don't have the same presence of the motor in the, in that car that's true it's okay more remote so there was an nc3 which was another facelift which sort of toned down the happy stupid fucking smiley face that just yeah they dumb. put a bar in the grill that makes it look a little more macho and a little bit less like it, well, I thought I always thought of it as giving it braces because it got like a chrome trim. <laughs> well, the early, the first NC2 had a chrome all the way around. Oh, maybe they got rid of it. They got rid of it. So it got its braces taken off. <laughs> yes, and it uh, had a reasonably nice smile after that. And then ND comes out. And now ND is an interesting story because ND proved the entire industry wrong. I mean, right. I can't tell you how many product planning and, and marketing presentations I've sat through from, especially the German car companies, where they're like, this is just... All of the things that you guys as enthusiasts want from cars just aren't available anymore. And it's because of legislation and fuel economy. We cannot drop in horsepower. We cannot drop in weight. We cannot drop in complexity. The cars have to get bigger, fatter, heavier, um, and less involving. And ND was a huge middle finger to all of them. Yeah. Well, and the NC was an interesting shift because the NC shared architecture with the RX-8. Mm. And so it's a little bit more adult feeling chassis. It's a little more buttoned down. It's a little more substantial. And that's why the NC weighs so much more than the NB because they were like, oh, it has to share stuff with like a bigger car. Mm -hmm. And we have to sort of combine resources and have some shared architecture. So they didn't do that with the ND. Clean sheet. Yeah. Yeah, it was a clean sheet car, clean sheet engines too, right? Um, and it went back, it was amazing because what the original Miata came out in 1990 model year and ND was what, 2016? Um, so you hear of 26 years later, a car goes back to the original size of the car and the original weight. Yes. It's, like, it's like a three or 400 pound drop in weight. Right. Or, and I, re- I remember at the same, like MPG went up also uh, a couple, a couple points, but I remember the automatic gained 25% in, in fuel economy. And I use that as example all the time for the Germans who are like, well, we are chasing 1.2%, but we've put in this clutched alternator and this charging strategy for the EPA. So, you know, these BMWs have back to BMWs, surprisingly. 
uh, battery issues because they are programmed to only charge the battery when the batteries below a certain state of charge. So they can basically optimize for another 10th of a mile per gallon on the EPA cycle. Um, and the result is if you don't drive the car often enough, the battery dies. Um, you know, and they're doing this to chase a 10th or two of miles per gallon. Then you get a check engine light. Shocking in a BMW. Shocker. But then I would say to them, like, you guys are chasing a tenth of percent. And Miata just got 25% more efficient. You're wrong. The ND proved the entire industry and everything they stood for wrong. It passed all crash tests. It passed modern everything and is a revelation to drive. Genuinely fun. Very hilarious, actually. Yep. Too hilarious, probably. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think we experienced that. So we had this rally and a friend of ours has an NC2 and a half club, the one you want, uh, and an ND2. So it, that we didn't talk about the difference between ND1 and ND2. They added, we went from 155 horsepower to 181, and they retuned the suspension. What they else? did that slightly earlier on the suspension, but they, for the, the big thing for ND2 was that they basically pulled an NC2 move, which was to take the engine and uh, give a different valve train for higher revs. So it lost no torque. It basically just gained at the top end and went from a 6,400 RPM redline to 7,000, 72, 774, somewhere in there. A much higher i think it was 800 more rpm um which really woke up that engine because the nd was direct injected you know a fully modern engine and it had power everywhere it was much torquier in the mid-range especially than the nc um, but it would just run out of revs and so mm, driving it you were just constantly hitting the limiter yeah, as a sports car it's not what you want no. you want to be like holy shit and you look down at the tack you're like wow more to go how exciting mm -hmm. versus bap, 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 hitting a limiter before long before you think you should acoustically um, okay, so back to our rally. So we had an NC2 and a half, so NC3, which quite unfairly had a set of shocks and springs on it and grippy tires. Mm -hmm. And the ND2, which it was stock, but it's a club with the Recaros and Brembos and what is the third part of BBS wheels? Mm -hmm. The one you want, in the color you want. Yeah, Soul, Crystal, Red, Red Crystal, George Michael. Michael. Well, it's Mica, like isn't it, right? But like you got to call it George Michael. Yeah. Soul, crystal, red, George Michael, metallic. Um, and uh, God, is that color beautiful? Yeah. Gorgeous. Uh, so the the mission for the weekend was to switch between the cars at regular intervals and decide which one to keep because Miata yeah. is always the answer, but not Miata's is well, always the yeah, answer. Yeah. Its owner has an FD RX-7, I, the one that I covered for, for Revelations, and now this NC2 and, and ND2. Yes. And he was trying to figure out which one to keep. Mm -hmm. and uh we, we switched at the end of day two mm -hmm. i think and we each took turns in the two miate because he was sort of struggling and going back and forth between them and couldn't make a decision throughout so i think the first thing we should say is everyone's use case is slightly different right so in this case he has a daily driver he can well the nd has been the daily driver replaced now with an e46 325 xit a an exit <laughs> exit <laughs> i think that yogs it uh yeah so an e46 wagon all-wheel drive automatic for his like tahoe snow car mm -hmm. um and daily commute which is pretty pretty cool daily driver nice That's car like, too mm -hmm. one owner car nice really clean i've yet to see it in person i just saw it covered in snow in tahoe which means he's now paid for itself because he's driving Because you can't snow. do that in the miata nope um and so nd sort of needs to walk away from daily driver duties and I will say, I think ND is a better daily driver than NC. Yes, I mean, the interior is much higher end. Mm -hmm. Huge difference in high high endness of the interior. And you have CarPlay, and it's a much nicer Although place to spend Typical time. Mazda, CarPlay is disabled as soon as you're moving. So you have to, well, touchscreen yes. is disabled as soon as you're moving. So you got to use that stupid spinny wheel. The Julia is the same. Fucking dumb. Yeah. Dumb. Yeah, I mean, you and I are spoiled by the VW experience where you just poke things and it works well it's every other car maker is that uh, so yeah except I mean, for alfa romeo apparently oh, well here's the thing is a lot of the uh, mazda Maybe they got it out of the fiat and then the, put it in the julia right <laughs> uh, mazda took the stance that touchscreens are dangerous <clears throat> and i understand why they did this and because a poorly designed touchscreen compared to a well-designed rotary selector knob i.e i drive and we're back to fucking bmw um really is far more distracting, right? So you can just reach down and feel. And the idea is that, you know, I've seen BMW try to tout a lot of research about this early on, 
where you can sort of look over, you glance over and you look back at the road and you know that you have to go three cl clicks over to the right, for example. And you can do those three clicks, glance over very quickly to make sure that you're where you think you are and then click the button to select something. Whereas you don't have that haptic touch back, a touch feed, feed haptic touch feedback on a touch screen. You're as you're you have an arm extended and you're you know bouncing up and down and you then have to look and aim and make sure you've hit the right spot. So they've BMW very clearly proved that a rotary selector knob, especially at the time, was far less distracting. But then Apple came in and just did CarPlay, which is so simple and so pared down, and the buttons are so large, even when it's on a small screen, that it really is a much easier and quicker way of interacting with the car but mazda and alfa romeo kind of stuck to their guns and like touch screens are dangerous and ruined the miata experience i literally wouldn't buy an nd because of that really mm -hmm. i don't care enough for that to be the reason why i wouldn't buy an nd i wouldn't buy an nd for other reasons okay fair enough but i'm, I'm which sorry i discovered a daily at this point a daily driver needs to just something that i use as an appliance as a daily driver let me let me say that much just needs to fucking work and then I get out of my way in terms of your modern stupid, stupid safety features. Like if I had to turn off lane keep assist every single time I got in the car, dead to me. I don't need to do that. I don't want to fight with my car. I bought you. I paid for you. You do what I say. Does that sound mean? No. Why is no one laughing? They've all died. They're all they're actually busy <laughs> peeing instead of laughing out of terror. Um, yeah. But anyway, so ND makes a, other than the stupid fucking CarPlay decision, makes a really nice daily driver. Yeah, it's pretty comfortable. The motor is not obtrusive, which is exactly the thing that makes it not ideal as a driving enthusiast car. Is that you like look down, you're like, is this thing on? Is it time to shift? What mm -hmm. gear am I in? How many RPM? Like no, no RL cues in you the way that totally missed an opportunity to be like, where what gear am I in? Is it running? Get off my lawn! You, you forgot your own age for a second. Well, <clears throat> it's the dementia. <laughs> um yeah so this it was interesting to watch our friend get through the first day of back roads driving and initially not trust the nd which is really interesting so there were two guys that were split were sort of switching off between nc and nd and they both sort of had the feeling that they couldn't trust the nd and it's two reasons i think number one is squishy marshmallow tires and two is an, a very unruly rear end Nobody likes an unruly rear end. No, you need to have control over that shit. <laughs> and this was a, a, a decision purposely made by Mazda. Um, I've spoken at length with Dave Coleman, who's the guy who tunes these cars. And their goal was to make the car, make a Miata, be fun at four tenths. Right. So you're driving it normally. And when you have really soft springing, especially at the rear, and no roll control whatsoever, the car just sort of leans in whatever direction and you feel like you're moving really quickly at three and four tenths sort of keeping up with traffic that makes the nd more fun when you're pushing it on a back road holy shit does that get old yeah i mean the struggle that i had with that car was that i felt like i was spending a lot of time managing the back end instead of driving the car mm -hmm. and it was distracting and it was like i felt like my baseline stress level was just higher in that car because it was like there's all this stuff happening in the back of the car and i'm like what are you doing back there and like you try to get on the throttle and it immediately starts to step out and it just it was a handful in a non-constructive way. It's interesting because I've had some of the best moments as sort of vignettes of my driving career behind the wheel of an ND, right? I've had so much fun where you get in a car and you have you know a hill in front of you on a twisty road and you're just ass first through every single corner, howling like an idiot. Um, you turn in, the back end goes sideways. You get on the gas, it goes even more sideways. And just when you're reeling it in, you sort of start to lift off like for a second for no reason. It gets even more sideways. And the car is just like a playful puppy. But puppies are a pain in the ass. And what Yeah, was... I mean, periodically they shit everywhere. <laughs> exactly. Control over your rear end. It always comes back to that. <laughs> that and BMWs. <laughs> um <laughs> Well, we keep returning to BMWs. Yeah, and puppy and shitting all over the place. Yeah. Yes. Um, but what, it was really interesting because we're in the middle of this three day rally. And I, you know, I just been spending time in other cars. We'll get to that in a second. Um, and I get in the ND, and the first thing I did was eat it on a corner. I mean, turned in, and before I even got on the gas, maintenance throttle turn in, threw itself sideways. And I caught it, laughed, and I was like, what the fuck? And then drifted the rest of the way of the corner out of the way. And look, this is what I do is slide cars around for a living. So it's second nature to me, but it occurred to me right off the bat. Like I got in, started the car, turned off stability control and went. And I'm like, wow, had our buddy been driving this car, I'm not sure his hands would be quick enough to control that. 
And the, and the problem is you have to slow your inputs down on the, on the way into a corner or you will throw the car sideways. And that yes. was my first mistake. I did that. But the, well, I mean, you were getting out of a, an old car with a s- comparatively slow rack, as was right. I. Right, but the, the problem is you have to slow your input on the way in, but then you had better be quick to catch it on the, when the back steps out. Mm-hmm. So you have this dichotomy of like, oh, I have to cool my inputs and slow it down. Oh, but then a really quick, quick correction where you're going to spin or go off. Um, and so I thought, all right, well, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I would advise him to turn off the stability control. I don't know what, you know, I've never been in the car with him sideways or whatever. I don't know what his skill level is. And I got to the next corner and the same fucking thing happened. And the same fucking thing happened after the corner after that. And so the first three corners, I was frustrated. And then I'm like, oh, hold on. This is the stupid sideways machine that I love so much. And then just obliterated every corner sideways from that point on. But I drove the car maybe six miles. And by the end of it, I was already sick of it. And I thought, you know what? I have to be so on my A game, controlling, managing the mass of the rear end, and then controlling the inevitable slide that I think I would just slow it down and put a stability control back on if I was per- certainly was doing a 600 mile drive. Yep. Yeah. I mean, this is the car that when I drove it for the first time, I like felt a little bit teary almost because I was like, man, this isn't going to be around much longer and this isn't available in a lot of other places and this has got to be the end. And so I felt I had a very strong emotional reaction the first time I drove this exact car. Uh, but yeah, in this context where we're going, like spending time going 10 tenths or, you know, eight and a half tenths or whatever, it, uh, it's not the right tool for that. And so as a daily driver, it actually makes a ton of sense because it's very entertaining in most daily driver things. And you can actually be entertained in a daily driver, which is like, which is uh, rare. Yeah. I mean, that motor is torquey. So the gears are so short, the motor is really responsive and really torquey, but that was the other thing. It was gone with the top down on a mountain road in second and third gear. You You couldn't couldn't hear hear it. it. It wasn't very present. Whereas in the NC, it was transmitting sort of vibrations and, and anger into the car and you into the cabin, and you have a really clear sense of what the motor's doing. It's very transparent in that sense. Yeah. I and mean, then we have not talked about steering. Well, okay. So we'll come back to the NC in a second. Steering, electric power steering. I feel like a broken record. I feel like a broken record. I feel, I feel like, like a broken, broken record. record. There's just, oops, hit the mic. There's just an inherent annoyance in electric power steering. It's going to filter out almost everything. And uh, the Miata steering, NC, ND1 was okay. I think, I feel like ND2 got a little bit better because it has a better sense of straight ahead. When you're on the highway, it doesn't wander as much. But really, there's just no contest. NC2 was hydraulic and it was just better. Yep. Um, yeah, there were, I felt like there was no change in weighting with vehicle load. Um, that's so unnerving to me is it because all the cars that i'm really used to driving quickly uh they really weighed up well your porsche which was the car that you were driving that week was is i mean a really great example of a power power assisted steering that does not feel like it's power assisted at all everybody who drives that car is like does this car have power steering well there's there's no weight up there so it's a surprise that it's even as heavy as it is right yeah um it's really good feel some power steering it also has really nice, for me, brake modulation. I know that other people found it unnerving. But, I, I mean, those cars are just second nature to me I suppose, uh, yeah. at this point. I mean, you've been driving no, air-cooled 911s for too long to be objective about them. I would say that your car is... I've been the, driving air-cooled 911s since before they were invented. Wait. If there's ever been a hyphenated statement, that would be it. Um, the control weighting on your car is even in that everything is consistent, but it's all crazy heavy. And... The ND is the same way where everything is super light, but it's all video gamey in, in that it's just nothing. The shifter is unbelievable, um, but it's not like you feel anything back through a shifter. It's just... Yes, it's gear. just very precise and easy to use and instinctive. I mean, I will say the first time I ever drove a Miata, and I think it was an NC2, and I you know, was like, oh, it's going to be cheap. It's going to be cheap and cheerful, and I got into it, and I felt the shifter, and I was like, this is maybe one of the best shifters I've ever touched. And that's before even starting the car. And I was like, holy shit. I did not expect this, the shifter to feel so expensive. It really does feel expensive. expensive. I mean, it's so funny that, you know, car companies. And they're all like that. They're all of them. All of them. From even the, the very, MB. from the very, yeah, from the very beginning. <laughs> the one we shit on. Even NC1. It, was, it wasn't it was bad. It lost some of the magic of NA. Um, but ND and NC are just, NC2 are just magic. And the thing is, these are the things you interact with. We talk about steering and we talk about shifters and we talk about clutch take up and feel because there are very few things you actually touch and move in a car. Um, and a shifter is just so important. Um, 
But that motor, I mean, you now let's compare and contrast to NC. So I drove ND first. I don't remember. I drove whatever it was. I got in the... Must yes, you drove ND first. ND first. And I couldn't wait to get out of it because we're coming. I was, we drove up the hill and then we're, I'm coming back down the hill. And I almost looped it coming into a corner trail braking. I'm just managing that rear end. I kind of turned a little bit under braking, got sideways again. And I'm like, I'm done. I'm sick of this. Like, I just want to now get out of the car, having not wrecked my friend's car, and get into the NC and just enjoy that experience. And it just pissed me off. Got in the NC and I'm like, immediately, seating position's better. You're lower. Yes. Um, you do feel very up high in the ND. Yeah, you're fit sitting on top like of the Like the NB. Both mm-hmm. of those cars, you feel a little bit like, should I look over the top of the windshield or yeah, through the motor? through it. Um, and then I started it, and I could feel the motor. And what a difference. I mean, what a difference. This is the difference between a current Civic Type R and a Civic SI, for example. I guess last gen now. Um, SI, can't tell if it's running. Type R, you feel everything the engine's doing. Makes all the difference in the world. And so you floor it in this thing. The gears are, I think, a little bit longer than ND. They're still stupid short, like, you know, 55 miles an hour in a second gear max, 53, somewhere in there. Um, and the end, But the engine has a build. And instead of just being... Yes, a progression. Right. And ND, instead of... ND's kind of like powerful the whole way from idle to red line. Yeah, but never you never really hear it. Or feel it. Or feel it doesn't it. wake up. The NC goes through these different phases of sound, character, so it's sort of and power delivery, right? So it starts out, it's like, okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. And it from like a thousand to three or four thousand, it just gradually builds in torque. So you feel that as a shove. And from four thousand to like sixty five hundred, it's now peaked in torque, but you know, racing towards horsepower peak. And it's just angrier and angrier and angrier. And then at six and a half grand, it fucking gets so mad. <laughs> and that build from especially once you're over seven thousand, and there's nothing more satisfying than being five hundred RPM deep into red line you're like i think i have to holy fuck and it just keeps pulling and pulling and pulling and angry yeah it's like your own personal mini gt3 really is yeah really is and i you know i I um, four cylinders can be really boring but the exceptional four cylinders can be really good i mean yeah so you have this in your volkswagens you have this in the nc what other great four cylinders? Alfa Romeos, old mm. Alfa Romeos. Even the Mercedes, the Cosworth motor is, is ridiculous. It? Yeah. I haven't really exercised it. Horsepower. S14? No. no. No, S14, I don't like at all. S14 is peaky and vibrating in all the wrong ways. So it actually does make quite a bit of torque um, throughout the whole rev range, which is unexpected. S14 meaning E30 M3 motor. Yep. Sorry. Nerd alert. And we're back to being lobbyists. Hey, look, look what we did. Um, but that, the E30 M3 motor actually does have quite a bit of torque. Annoyingly, more torque than the 2.5 and the 325i does under 4,000. But everyone gets in an E30 M3 and says, oh, it's gutless until 4,000. It's actually not. The problem is that the vibrations that it makes are so much greater than the torque that it makes. So it makes all this noise and these vibrations that are out of sync with what's going on so they're very they're i th- they're i think like piston v- vibration not power like impulse vibrations if you, if you know what i mean like four cylinders have rough power delivery because they only, only fire power exactly pulses. per so there's you know it only fires once per per rotation and so you get this gruff power delivery but in the s14 what i think you're feeling is the, the pistons actually vibrating themselves because it's a 2.3 liter four cylinder with no uh balance, balance shafts yeah. And so you're just like, ooh, what the fuck? Like, why is it vibrating this much and not moving? And it then lends the the impression that it's torqueless, even though it's not. The Kazi, the Mercedes motor, is the opposite way. Completely smooth as silk. Um, you'll but so when you're at three or four thousand RPM, not under a lot of throttle, it's silent. You just you feel a tiny little buzz in the background, and then when you get on it, you get a layer of angriness, right? Anger that's from the power pulses, and it has a power plateau of from like 6100 to 6600 rpm it's this huge insane long power peak nuts just nuts angry pissed off great intake noise um but nothing will ever beat a k20 oh yeah i mean experiencing it that and especially in a lease in a series one at least of all things i mean it's just like holy moly like you feel like you're on a rocket ship that that you're, and you're attached to yeah you're tied to it 
You're like the guy in uh, Doctor Strange Love when he's riding the bomb down with the cowboy hat on. He's sitting on the bomb. You ever seen this? Nope. I don't know. I'll take I'm your word for it. Dating myself. Anyway, he, they drop a new. Can you go, so if I tell you to go fuck yourself, that's like the same thing as dating yourself. I have to date myself and then first. go fuck myself. Right? <laughs> you don't put out on the what first date. What kind of girl date? do you think I am? <laughs> um, uh, wow, that went downhill very, very quickly. Doctor Strange, love. Uh, um, strange indeed that you're fucking yourself. But um, well, good someone for you. told me to go fuck myself. So. I've been telling you that for years. <laughs> uh, he, there's a scene where he's he they're dropping a nuke and he's he he's it's it's a World War Three scenario. It's a doomsday thing. Uh, and we don't need that fucking negative. The guy here. is he's sitting on the nuke, you know, riding it down to drop it on the, the Soviets, and um, he he's anyway he's just sitting there like a cowboy riding like he's insane. He's totally deranged. Uh, anyway, that's how it feels to be in a K twenty powered Elise series one. But on the descent, because I feel like well, no, just like this insane, yeah. like I'm riding a bomb, basically. Like it's just this like full on oh, wind in your hair, like we're fucking going to the end of the world. Okay, so that is going to have to be an insert. Annoyingly, hey Paolo, we're going to have to write this time code down because I'm going to have to put an insert right here of Derek. I think you were giggling in that one because you were in the passenger no, seat. I think I was very professional. You were probably shocked. Silent is what was going on. So this was a K20A, uh, which was... I think Japanese. we've used this insert Probably. maybe. Perhaps. Oh, I, I don't know. Anyway, it's a pivotal moment in my life because I realized that in, in a Series 2 release with a Toyota 2ZZ, the engine is just a means to an end and the, the rest right. of the car stand Propelling out. Propelling the car. And the uh, in a, the Series 1 K20 swap that we drove, or that I drove, that you rode in, the engine is by far the high the best part of the car um so it it rises from the toyota 2zz level of just being there for a reason to the absolute star of it are you going to swap yours do you need a series 2 with a k20 swap in, in all seriousness if i had the time or money to do that i would swap or i'd buy i would sell my elise sc and buy a k20 swapped elise yeah series 2 no, no question about it i would love that in my miata k20 and anything Anything sort of that likes a sporty motor. Because if you think about think about how much we loved the engine in the NC2, and now imagine a K in there, <laughs> like or even better, like the K24 hybrid swaps that yeah, that all the cool kids do with like 300 horsepower. <sighs> I don't even need that. That's I mean I like that also because it preserves the character of the car. I feel I have, I have these strong opinions for no reason about motor swaps. Like everybody puts LSs and BMW E39s, and for whatever reason that just doesn't sit with me. I know that it should. I should know that I shouldn't care, but for whatever reason, it just doesn't sit with me. But I for, for I like to have certain. I like usually OEM, but this is a situation where it's like no, it it doesn't have to be the OEM swap. Because the other thing that people do in, when they're in a hurry to put more power in, say, an NC, is I think you put the there's like a Mazda SUV motor, which is the same motor, but it's a two and a half liter mm -hmm. instead of a two liter, and that's like the sort of quick and dirty motor, like power swap solution for an NC. I think it's a Mazda SUV. It's mm -hmm. shared with the Ford Escape or something yeah, like it's that. It's that the corporate Mazda Ford two and a half liter. Yeah, I you know I, I've never I've never driven a two and a half liter swapped Miata, but I've certainly driven enough cars with that Mazda two and a half liter. And it's I mean it's in the Mazda six, it's fine. Yeah, but there's anyway. nothing. It ain't a fucking K series. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Anyway, that would be what I really want. I want an NC two. So I went back actually and watched the the Miata versus Fiat video that I did for Motor Trend when the Fiat 124 Spider came out. Is that and back on YouTube? Allegedly. Oh, huh. interesting. Anyway, um. So I I went back and watched that video because my recollection of it was I couldn't decide whether I liked the Miata the nd1 better than the fiat 124 or either of them better than an nc2 and so my business partner slash director anthony who you guys heard me mention a million times um he had an nc2 at the time and we brought it out and none of us could decide what we want what like better what we really wanted was an nc2 motor in an nd2 body with fiat 124 suspension and steering um, also and steering from, from nc2 yeah 
Um, and we just kept going back and forth and back and forth. And, uh, and now I just think, fuck that. Give me an NC2 with a K20A swap and I'm, yes. I'll shut up about everything else. Yeah, but even, I mean, the, even the NC2 motor out of the box is better than the ND motor. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So it was really interesting because we, we you and I went up and did our run up the hill and back and we did three. So we do, I always kind of do ABA. So car one, car two, and then go back to car one just to cement the impressions. And, you know, our friend walked over and said, what do you think? And the two of us were just like, <laughs> vomited all like of Basically this. the content of this entire episode. Yeah, pretty much. But in 30 seconds, we're like, get rid of that fucking ND. And I'm really surprised to hear us that we were so in agreement about that. It depends on the mission. Right. I mean, we were using it in the sort of like hauling ass mode as an enthusiast car and getting out of both, both getting out of less refined cars. Yep. Uh, and so even the NC2 felt, less refined or, or more refined than sort of we want it so if you choose and then you go to the nd and it's even more refined then you're like oh this is two steps in the wrong direction for this mission which is going out and hauling ass but you know if you want car play and fuel economy and less old and a higher rent interior then the nd makes sense or you you know you never go more than five tenths well, we, the other thing was we kept bringing up was price, right? Because yes. right now his ND has, uh, he has one and a half times as much money invested in his ND as he does his, in his NC. And the yeah. question then was, if you keep the ND, then you're going to have to do shock springs and tires, right? I mean, you're going to have to, to do the suspension ND. and tires to the ND. Yes. Um, if, whereas this is where this, the comparison isn't really entirely fair. The NC had shock springs and Pilot Super Sports on it. Yeah. Um, out of the box, NC was definitely more buttoned down and more cohesive and drove as a whole than the nd2 which is a little bit floppy but for that mission it was just a hundred percent clear to the two of us like one of these cars is a pain in the ass that you have to drive around yeah. and the other one does exactly what you want when you want it and thrills you yeah it was interesting to watch his reaction which was i don't like the way that that thing makes so much noise i think my you know variable valve timing is broken because i can't believe the sound that the nc2 makes and we yeah. were like that's like, the best that's part. the best part yeah which is so and, fascinating but yeah he's like it's so much raw and i was like i mean yes it's raw than the nd but i think you said to him it's a fucking sports car <laughs> you were not did i say that yeah it's good <laughs> i like angry hyphen <laughs> oopsies um, but i stand by that yeah it was uh it was way more of an experience yeah it's much more of an experience which is ultimately as we've talked about always what you and i seek in our cars and uh i think sufficiently refined and sufficiently low effort to live with i mean these cars are, are inexpensive to keep and you sort of do routine stuff and so it depends on what your reference point is your reference point is a kia that's under warranty for a hundred thousand miles then yes it's going to be some level of effort to own this car but if you're used to a 30 year old german car oh my god then, then it's, it's like practically a prius it's, at that point it's, but yeah it's practically a prius it's, and it's practically free to run by comparison i think in terms of the amount of joy that you get out of the car for how little it costs i think it's still really good roi although you did say <laughs> you know you'd exactly to get back going. in your six thousand dollar e30 All right. and have the suspension at one corner go and then the suspension at another corner go and then the heat shield fall off and not untrue <laughs> but fuck you. in exchange of free or six thousand dollars <laughs> but you hold also on, hold get on. let's be ongoing. honest he also blew a shock in the end and so we beat might the have been shit out of these pre-blown cars. Right, and we finished it off. Yes. Same thing with Beatrice. So Beatrice is my 1989 325i sedan that used to be bronze it, but fell down a flight of stairs and <laughs> was hit in every corner with a with a paint fade stick. And um, her job is to be the car that I don't cosmetically care about, so I can park anywhere and not worry about door dings and, and whatnot. Um, and I couldn't help but think as much fun as that NC2 was, getting the E30 was a no-brainer. I mean, just part of it is that motor. That motor. The M20 motor, that inline six, is just tremendous. Magic. Absolute magic. And everyone who drove, so when, when the Miata guys got out of the Miatas and into the, the into Beatrice, they were like, oh my God, the motor. And, you know, one of them was like, oh, torque, to have torque. That's the joke. The joke is that the M20 has no torque, but it is a two and a half liter six instead of a two liter four cylinder. Um, and so by comparison, it has some sort of torque. And it doesn't ever sound strained. It sounds amazing. Everyone in the rev range. Um, and Beatrice also does have a quick ratio steering box or steering rack. So it's got the Z3 1.9 rack. It's 2.9 turns lock to lock. That's um, the fast one. That's the fastest one. And that's pretty quick. I mean, that's quick. That's that's now puts it from 1970s and 80s sort of steering rack. Deeply into the 90s. And 2000s. 
I feel like I feel like two. I think it might even be two six. But either way, two six two nine somewhere in there. It's quick, and it's more importantly quick enough that I never had to reach over. I mean, I could do you know yeah, no sort shuffle. of nine and three. Um, I tend to not drive drive an E30 at 9 and 3 because the steering wheel is so canted away from me that I wind up being like, I can't reach arm. the top. And yes, then like, I've, I've run out of arms. And then I fundle my it, testicles it at the bottom. Much. And it's, yeah, it's bad. It's the same thing with the Mira. When you put this, that's the, fu- the first thing I noticed when I got in there. It's same thing with the E28 M5. And with the E30, you get in and you're like, why am I driving like a bus? The school bus. Kids, settle back. <laughs> Simmer down back there, kids. Yeah, one more peep out of you and I will turn this rally around and we will go home. <laughs> my God. You should be a parent. Um, I have. Three generations. You have three generations I'm just kidding. In, in, 94, in 94 years. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Are you ever going to turn 95? Or is I did, but it... Uh, it, didn't stick. It didn't stick. <laughs> it didn't stick this year. Um, yeah, it was really it was really interesting to me that that Miata. You know, we all think of Miata as the answer, and I tell people constantly to buy NDs because if they're looking for a fun daily driver, and they don't want something like a BRZ, they just want something really all laughs. It's ND is the answer for rally duty, and C is the answer in the Miata conundrum. But it really depends how you how much of your time you spend near the limit. I mean, that's the true deciding factor is how much time are you going to spend at the limit? Well, and then the, and if the, if the answer is a lot of it, then the answer is E30. There is no contest. I mean, the NC kind of understeered, you know, until you really were hard on the gas. It didn't have enough power to really overwhelm those pilot super sports. Um, and it was precision and it was good and it was great. But that engine and the steering had nothing on the E30, which yeah, is shocking. It, um, which is funny because the car to me, the when I first drove an NC, the car that I kept thinking about was E36 M3. Really? In terms of the chassis, the balance mm. of the chassis and how mature it is and how buttoned down it felt, it just felt like a good old fashioned front engine rear wheel drive car that was really like well balanced front to back. Mm. That was instinctive. Something about getting in BMWs, and this is true of your E30, but you know any front engine, uh, any of the good six cylinder BMWs that are rear wheel drive, there's something about it that feels, except for the E46 M3, because I hate the shifter. Re- what you don't of all things, you're gonna listen to that chainsaw and you want to well, complain yes. about the I shifter? I don't like the motor. I don't like the shifter. It, I mean, I, I'm an E36 prefer for sure. Preferer. Pref- Prefer, prefer, you prefer, prefer, yeah, preferer of the E36 M3 over the E46. Yeah, me too. Um, interesting, but yeah, no, you you got out of the the third Beatrice, and you said there's an inherent rightness to this car, um, yeah. which is funny because look at it. <laughs> there's it looks nothing. like there's an inherent wrongness yeah. to everything about it when you yeah. look at the car. Yeah, and I hated that I enjoyed it so much, but why? I mean, because it's so fucking predictable. I mean, no, Camus enjoys another being love you. But, you know, there's a reason I have three E30s, I guess. I mean, I got out of the, the last time that this car did this to me, the last time I really drove it was I got out of the uh, Blackwing, a CT4V Blackwing, which I pre- much preferred to the CT5V Blackwing. And I got out of having driven all these major cars on a back road, and I thought, nope, no contest. That This car is so much more fun, and it's so much more manageable at the limit and it's so much more neutral, and it's so much more playful, and it sounds better, and it's all mechanical noise and no fake bullshit. And I just like have these moments where I'm like, I just want to step out of the new car world. I, I'm just so disappointed in most new cars. If you've taken, if you've engineered everything out, and you have to put it back in, you failed at your job. As far as you're concerned, but I think a lot of consumers are not uh... bullshit. Consumers are buying what they need to buy because that's what's available right now. But if new cars were so good, tell me why old cars are so expensive. This has got to be, and I hate to use this term because I sound like a CNN reporter, unprecedented. Everything used is a fortune. I don't know if that's ever Everything? been the case. Everything. Think of but it. That's like a like economic supply chain. Okay, like- no, no, no. All right, hold on. I don't mean like a, a 2017 Hyundai Elantra is worth 25% more than it was a couple years ago. That is the case right now that's a temporary bubble because of su- supply chain issues thanks to COVID. Think about what 80s, 90s, and early 2000s cars are going for. So let's think of cars that are like 15 years old. Now go back 15 years and think about what cars that were 15 years old were worth then. 
I think there's growing momentum around automotive enthusiasm. I remember being genuinely like hand dringy, like concerned. Mr. Burns? Yes. Excellent. Uh, In 2005, about the future of automotive enthusiasm, I was like, nobody is going to be here to pick up the torch and I'm going to be standing here by myself in the future. Right. And obviously the exact opposite of, of that happened. Well, think about it this way. In 2002... I bought my E30 for $1,500. Mm-hmm. That car is a $50,000 car now. But for everyone, yeah, for your wagon, I definitely. Um, but for every one of those stories, I think it's a cyclical thing. Like this is like people were talking about Gullwings used to be $7,500 in 1976, you know? It's like. But that's why I say go back 15 years. So let's look at 15 year old cars now and then go back 15 years ago and look at 15 year old cars then. Excuse me, but 15 years old car is an E46 M3. Right. Have you seen what those are worth? Yeah. So typically you have, I understand what you're saying. What you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is there's always cars depreciate and then they sort of hit a rock bottom price and then they go back up. And at some point, maybe- Unless it's a Sunfire. Even that, they start to go up. I don't say they go back up all the way, but most cars will hit their original MSRP at 25 years kind of right i mean you sort of see this 20 25 year mark where they inflation has gone up in the, in the interim and they just start to go back up a sunfire might be worth nine thousand dollars now when it was worth seventy five hundred dollars a couple years ago but i think both of those numbers are high i think it's i'm being nice to sunfire drivers is it aren't sunfires like we've looked at this because we were thinking about the pontiac <laughs> endurance test <laughs> <laughs> the, this, the current sunfire market I, who knows? Wait, we need an entire episode dedicated oh, the, to the, the current sun, Sunfire yeah. episode <laughs> market. <laughs> Great idea. Write it down. Um, no, but I just, I really think 15-year-old cars have never been worth a lot of money. Like 15-year-old 911, when a 996 was 15 year old, 15 years old, they were worth 20,000 bucks. No one I wanted 17 them. for mine. Right? And now a 15-year-old 911 is a, is a 997. And they're worth 50, 60,000 bucks for a shitty one. 996s are still worth 20, they're worth like $25,000 now. Like they, they can be expensive, but you can still buy a $25,000 996. You can? Yeah. How? It's just got to have like 170,000 miles on right, it. Right, with a blown intermediate shaft rattling on and its an way automatic to convertible. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah, that doesn't No, no, count. no. Automatic convertibles are still well under 20. Are they? No, really? Yeah. I haven't been looking in the market. So this is why you, you know, do what you do at selling things yeah. at the ECME things. Or just generally being like, what shit heap should I burden myself with this week? <laughs> right. I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. If that's the case. I mean, if if 997s are... No, I, I don't, I'm don't. i just wondering to the extent to which this phenomenon that you're observing, which I do think there is legitimacy to, like there's people who are out there who are like, you know, with the existence of social media, especially I think Instagram, there's trends that sort of get picked up and spread relatively quickly, you know? fetishization of roof racks right everybody does a christmas card with a, a sports car with a christmas tree on it you know every there's this diffusion of trends and information that happens very rapidly whether it's in the car world or otherwise right now and i think that the stuff that used to happen used to have to be like i have to know exactly what rock to look under to find out about e30s mm-hmm. you know it used to be true and now there's this sort of clearinghouse where this information is widely accessible now and so everyone's like, no, no, have you heard how good E30s are? You know, it happens because of like people who make videos on YouTube, you know, about E30s, for example. Is Bunch the E30 dicks. video on YouTube, maybe? Yep. Oh, look at that. Uh, anyway, so there's a diffusion of information that happens in a really efficient way now that I think drives the dynamic around the enthusiasm and this critical mass and the, and the, the frothing of the market and hyping up and, and stuff hmm. moving uh, and... It's good overall because it means there's a lot of people who are enthusiastic about cars and people are like, look at this spec, look at this green interior BMW from the 90s or whatever. Don't ever use the word spec I know, with me. I know, I know. But I was, I was mimicking mm-hmm. someone okay. else to make fun of them for carmudgeonly purposes. I was, not <laughs> use, I was ironically <laughs> using it. Not, good. Okay, now that we've cleared that up. Um, so it, overall, it's good. I mean, there's enthusiasm. These cars are not going to get forgotten. They're, the values are frustratingly high. And, you know, like I was saying before, like I still think of... 964s is twenty five thousand dollar cars, and that's not true anymore. But overall, I'm pleased that there is enough enthusiasm and that Haggerty exists to save driving. What what is that? Never what is never stop driving. Never stop driving. Yeah. So overall, it's good. But yeah, it's frustrating for those of us who remember the days where you could just poke around and look under rocks. But 
you know, but we were whatever that movie is about the Saab 900 SPG that came out, uh, Drive My Car, I think it's called, where uh, they're like, oh God, there goes the neighborhood Saab 900 SPGs. You know, one sold on Bring a Trailer for 55 grand, I think another sold for 57. And it's like, okay, those cars have gotten expensive now. And everyone's like, I'm so angry. But that means they're now getting saved. Mm-hmm. Because it used to be that those things would just be like $1,900 and they all got burned up and they would rust at the bottoms of the fenders and the, the interiors would be fried and the headliners would be removed because they stopped being so. able to see out of the back window. <laughs> so they're like, oh, just cut it out. Uh, and so as these cars get expensive, at least they start getting saved. So it's a good thing. That's good. But yeah, it's also frustrating because the secret is out. But if you had to choose which world to live in, whether they all just get disappeared and fall by the wayside forever and, and just return to the earth or you know everybody's in a froth about how exciting they are then i'm okay i'm not a, i'm not okay with the prices but the rest of it i'm okay with i guess my question is are we in in uh, in a unprecedented phase or is are we just at that age right now where the things that we like are more expensive um i think it's the enthusiasm and the widespread of of it is is unprecedented and i'm okay with it is it would it be that way if the cars weren't actually better? Because yes. so you think even if the cars were shit? I right. mean, look at what choose your car of the nineteen sixties and look at what is valued it in two thousand three to two thousand nine. Even the shitty ones were that expensive? The way that eighties cars are now? Yeah. I mean like if objectively if you look at it, if you read the old publication the old meaning twenty years ago, publications about short wheelbase 911s you read them and they're like don't buy the short wheelbase ones those are the ones that are like spooky and they only have two liters and blah 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 and everyone's like get a two liter car they're so fun and alive and frothy and so people how many times in this one episode are you going to use the word frothy because i'm getting nauseated Should that we... might have been the third or fourth certainly third might have been fourth time you're frothing well do you have rabies yes <laughs> i guess i no, no, listen, I think that your your point is valid, but I think 911s are an exception. Okay, let's not, well, 911s are bad. They used to, people, people used to say they're bad cars, mm-hmm. right? They, objectively, they are bad cars. But any sort of iconic sports car, there was some period at some point, not any, but there's a, a period where people are like, oh, those are bad or they're inferior or it's just an old car and you don't want that. I, mean, I don't think that's happening anymore. I mean, if you start to look at some of all of the all of the cars that are aberrations and are cool and are throwbacks to the old stuff, no longer have that depreciating uh, depreciation curve. No, the best thing, I, the best example I can give you is 911, 991.2 GT3 Touring. They hit the market at one hundred and thirty eight thousand bucks or whatever their sticker was, and mm, just one forty three six. Excuse me, that's with destination or something. That's with like PTS and shit, right? No, that's without anything, uh, but with this. But I mean, it hit the, hit the ground at one hundred forty-five thousand bucks, stayed stable for about five minutes, and then just went straight up. Yeah. If the nine nine two was that good and that much better, do you really think nine nine one would would have that? I mean, there's trajectory? like a supply issue, also, which is why nine nine twos are selling uh, or seventy five to one hundred over. And is that supply issue actually a sign that? The overall more, market is larger, right? It's not just that Porsche isn't making enough 911s. It's that the, the auto industry isn't making enough cars that we find interesting. Yeah. So the point I was trying to make, which I didn't fail to do about old cars, is that objectively old cars are bad. Whether it's a car from the 80s and you're looking at it from the perspective of now or whether it's a car from the 60s and you're looking at the perspective of 20 years ago, you look at old cars and you say, like, okay, so Miras went from being a hundred to $200,000 in 2000 to being... 600 or 700 in 2007 8 you know they so the cars trebled in in value during that period which was less than 10 years but objectively a miura is not a good car it never was a good car you know if you say here's the performance it offers versus how much it costs here's how safe it is here has how easy, easy it is to live with here's how maintainable it is here's the economy that it gets you know by any objective measure an old car is not a good car uh and that's that is true then and that's true but and that enthusiasm for cars has always been driven by things that's not about objectively how the car performs because if given that you would buy a new boxster instead of a mira in 2002 Mm -hmm. or 2005 and so the thing that drives the values of these cars are non-objective things they're subjective things Mm -hmm. uh and that continues to be true now about cars from the 80s 90s and 2000s is that like a radio radio station (laughs) the greatest hits of the 80s 90s and today 
which spans the last 20 years. Which would be the greatest hits of the 2000s, 2010s, and yesterday. Um, um, well, so the point, I guess, is that, pe- that the values and, and enthusiasm for these cars has never been about how good they are compared to new cars. Uh, okay. And that you will always find people, like if you read 80s articles, they're like, everything's got fuel injection and there's like starting to put computers in cars and there's no chrome or wire wheels anymore. Like these newfangled cars have no soul. Like people were saying that in the 80s. Okay, we're going to have to do a whole other episode on this because we're, I, we're, we've are we strayed away from the Miata as the answer thing. And we've, although we actually came back to it because what we're saying is it's always about the experience. And yes. that's what where Miata delivers, whether it's N A N B N A C or N D. But, but I really do think we should do a look back at the early 80s because when I read articles from the early 80s, it's like, reading a suicide letter to your friends everyone is devastated every article is like well this went to shit too but this is my point is that in the in period people were like shitting on those cars they're like modern cars are so terrible and there's nothing redeeming about them and now we look at 80s shit and we're like no my God, but we so don't cool. we're not looking at 82 we're, so we're not looking at 78 through 83 we're looking at 87 88 89 which was the rebirth of the car the malaise era was over so the 80s are defined you know we can call it as the decade but really that was two different decades in cars you had the tail end of the malaise era which was genuinely not a good time to be an enthusiast and then you had the second half of that decade which was possibly the best time to ever be an enthusiast 80s through 90s and the early 2000s one hit after the next after the next from bmw from mazda from honda from nissan i mean think of a nissan as a, as a maker of cars today right we have z that i'm excited about gtr that whatever but what think about nissan in two in 1990 there was a Sentra ser the regular Sentra, the four-door sports car maxima holy shit they were yeah, everyone that was and a then good we year. had lexus like starting ZX is coming out yeah. too. And you had this rebirth of Lexus and Infinity and Acura. Well, what birth. a great, well, fair enough, fair enough. Rebirth of everything and birth of all this new Miata. amazing stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm sorry to say that I disagree with you, but I think we should look back at the 80s. Let's I think there's a fetishization of anything that's really mega, mega 80s, regardless of whether it's good or not. And I think that's the important thing is that even the Malays era stuff, if it's like maximum 80s, like imagine like a Starion, Starion from... Oh, yes. Like, but that's a cool car. That was always a cool car then. Yeah. But, but I think... But there's a, there is a fetishization. Somebody could show up with a Reliant K. Like, you know, some shit, genuinely bad K car. And if it's perfectly preserved and has wood paneling and a wagon and a turbo or whatever, and it was genuinely a terrible car, we will fetishize that and, and like it because it dis, it survived in spite of its terrible yes exactly that's the thing that i don't makes think it. their values are going to be through the roof because the experience didn't is once there. didn't a lebaron convertible with the wood paneling sell for fourteen thousand dollars this week or something like that oh god anyway i think it could happen okay i think we should talk we should talk about the 80s because i think there's that's a, a decade where i think people either see it as the end of the malaise era or the beginning of something new and uh I mean, those things are probably related. Right. Funny enough, the Miata is probably the the was the, the most shining beacon that that the car industry was back. I mean, in '89 when that car dropped, I remember everyone's mouth just being wide open. We're back. We have Brit- British roadsters again. Sports cars are back. Like we've we're finally made it through this horrendous time in the automotive landscape, um, and gave everyone a sign of hope with pop up headlights. That's a way to end the episode on an uplifting moment to counteract all of the curmudgeonly oh, yelling we did elsewhere. Fuck, we did it again. We have to stop being positive. All right. All right. Next time. Um, not COVID positive, please. Yes. Cough the other direction. For more negative impressions, we'll be back next week. And you can always find us at the Um mm-hmm. By the time this episode launches, hopefully we'll have some sort of podcast platform that all of this is on. But this is all an extension of the Haggerty Podcast Network, which is um, paying for that TV that's right there that shows the Carmudgeon Show. See, that's not that's not CGI. That's real. That's actually a TV look. See? Are we done yet? Yes. How about now? Still yes. Now? Oh, no, no, no. Let's start a new episode. Should okay. we do a new episode? Welcome to episode 52 of The Curmudgeon Show. My name is Jason Kamisa, and this is Derek Tam-Scott from ECME. I need a drink. Can you drink on camera?
motherfucker, don't you? Oh. <gasps> Cut. Cut. You'll have to decide where to cut that episode off because we could <laughs> right about there. <laughs>